Um, my name is George Perkovich from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here this morning. Um, I don't know about you, this is my first time in a suit and tie in a year and a half. Uh, it's my first time out in a public gathering. Um, I can think of no better occasion than Bastille Day and to welcome the foreign minister of uh, France. So I want to thank Ambassador uh, Etienne and his team for uh, hosting this gathering uh, and also for being a, a, a really um, important partner of the Carnegie Endowment in, in all our work uh, in Europe and Asia uh, as well. Um, we are here not only on Bastille Day, but also the 135th anniversary of France's gifting to the United States, uh, the Statue of Liberty. Um, that statue is still there to remind us of this country's most positive potential. Um, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. Um, those words were written by an American woman, Emma Lazarus, but they were inspired by the, the beauty and the power of the gift uh, from France. And I think France and the United States can continue to remind each other, as friends do, uh, when we forget our nation's most enlightened purposes uh, and, and the calling to take on great challenges. And one of those purposes today must be to maintain peace and security in the Indo-Pacific and also to preserve space for people to defend uh, their human rights, whether that be in democracies or in non-democracies, and to explore how France, the United States, and their allies can best do that. We are honored uh, here today to have Foreign Minister Yves Le, Le Drian um, and as well to guide our discussion, uh, the always thoughtful Susan Glasser from The New Yorker magazine. Foreign Minister Le Drian uh, is now deeply experienced in foreign and security affairs. He was an outstanding Minister of Defense uh, for France from 2012 through 2017 when he became uh, Foreign Minister. Uh, he for any of you who've had the pleasure of meeting with him, and I know for those who work with him, he's a man of great uh, integrity, common sense, and resolve. And early on, he understood and recognized the importance of the Indo-Pacific and meeting the challenges uh, arising from China's growth in power and wealth. And as Minister of Defense, he made this a priority personally and also for France's position. And he continues to do that now as foreign minister. And so that's what we're going to, uh, he's going to speak about to us and then have a conversation uh, with Susan Glasser. Uh, for those of you in Washington or who read the American press, Susan needs no introduction. She's uh, a Washington correspondent of the New Yorker magazine. Before that, she was the award-winning editor of Foreign Policy magazine, the founding editor of Politico magazine, a reporter for the Washington Post. She and Peter Baker wrote an outstanding biography of James Baker, uh, former Secretary of State, amongst many other uh, uh, positions, and are now um, writing a, I don't know if it's a biography, a book about Donald Trump, um, which will be very different than I think the James Baker uh, biography is, which I've read. I'm not sure I'll read the Trump one. I, I have read the Baker one. I urge you all to, uh, to read it, but Susan's going to guide us um, in that uh, discussion. Um, let me again thank you, and then most of all, thank again Ambassador Etienne and his colleagues for hosting us, and Foreign Minister Le Drian, please. George Perkovich, thank you for your wonderful introduction. And hello to Susan Glasser. 
and the ambassador, ladies and gentlemen. I must say that I'm very pleased to be here in Washington today. And I'm delighted that this first stage of the few days that I'm spending in the United States are giving me this opportunity to speak with you, uh, whether that's in person or virtually. Before all else, I would like to thank the Carnegie Endowment for giving me this invitation to, to speak about an aspect which in my eyes is essential for the transatlantic relationship in the 21st century. Currently, in the United States, all eyes are fixed on the Indo-Pacific, and in particular on China, and rightly so. Rightly so, because the Indo-Pacific has become a central key region for the various balances in the world, both in terms of its tensions and its potential crises. Also rightly so, because the matter of the relationship with uh, Chinese power, which continues to assert itself, is now coming into all of the major worldwide uh, issues under discussion. In Europe, this same awareness is rising. It is true that France, as an Indo-Pacific nation, because we are an Indo-Pacific nation, with our territories, thanks to which France has the second largest exclusive economic zone in the world, with our interests, with our populations, because we actually have 1.65 million nationals. Uh, it's, it's not a lot uh, compared to the total, but they are there. With permanent military forces as well, more than 8,500 troops. And all of these elements justify the establishment of a national strategy that is specific to this region for our country. But it is also true that the other members of the European Union and the European Union itself, which also has fundamental interests that are becoming increasingly important in this region, are also taking full stock of that situation. Now more than ever, we are collectively bringing a gaze that is clear, stripped of all naivety, about the challenges that are posed by China and the way that it is asserting its power. Currently, we are building a European strategy for the Indo-Pacific. And that will be one of the priorities of France as it chairs the European Union in the first half of next year. Already, France has, has been implementing since the speech of President Macron in, of Garden Island in Sydney in May of 2018, strengthened actions in the Indo-Pacific space based on four pillars. First, stronger, uh, stronger action to regu regulate regional crises, including maritime security and the fight against terrorism. Strategic and guiding partnerships with our major partners, uh, first of all, Japan, Australia, and India. And for the first time this year, I had a ministerial trialogue meeting that we set up with India and Australia. And that is just the first time, but it will be continued by other actions and other events. We are also working on strengthened mobilization with regional organizations, first of all, uh, ASEAN. And finally, we are working on a stronger commitment to promote worldwide public goods, particularly in terms of the climate, the environment, and biodiversity. Given the importance for the United States, the Indo-Pacific region is now naturally at the heart of the new agenda that we must carry forward together within the framework of the transatlantic relationships that we wish to refound and which we wish to rebalance. We have spoken about this topic together at the EU-United States Summit in June, and that was particularly relevant because concerning a number of issues that where we need to carry forward our model and our values, and the European Union has uh, tools and skills to act in that manner. I'm thinking about the climate, the digital space, and the technologies of tomorrow. I'm also, of course, thinking about the defense of human rights. The Indo-Pacific was also a topic of discussion at the G7 and the NATO summit, and in that last case, case, so that we could think together about the consequences 
in terms of security of the Euro-Atlantic space and transformations of the Indo-Pacific and China's behavior. And that's the case even though NATO is not an alliance that is turned against any specific country, nor is it an alliance whose center of gravity is in the Indo-Pacific. But the stakes are not only legal and security related, the stakes are also political. Because Europe, and this is one of the messages that I want to communicate today, Europe has already understood that there, it has no choice. It must assert itself on the international scene and assume its responsibilities. That is true in a number of areas. It's true also in the Indo-Pacific, which logically uh, ought to be one of the pillars of the agenda between the, the U European Union and the United States. The issues of the transatlantic pivot towards the Indo-Pacific that we must, uh, must implement together are enormous. This involves our ability to provide a democratic response that aligns with our values to the rise of authoritarianism. It involves our ability to provide an appropriate response to the brutalization of the world and to fight back against the challenge against multilateralism. And we must fully take on and assume international competition in every area. And it's precisely because the stakes are enormous that we must make sure that we do not fall into a way of thinking based on blocks, which would not be in our interest if only because we now live in a time defined by global challenges, such as the pandemic crisis, which we are reminded of each day. The approach that we must define together with respect to the Indo-Pacific is not founded on confrontation with China. Rather, the issue is different. We must concentrate our transatlantic efforts on defense and the promotion of our own model. That model is based on liberal democracy that cares for values, accountability, free information. And this is also an international order founded on rules and effective multilateral institutions. It is this twofold model that we wish to develop with our partners, partners from the Indo-Pacific, from Europe, from Africa, from the Middle East, because it is this twofold model that today is potentially being attacked because certain actors have an interest in demonstrating that this model is not effective, including to respond to the major challenges in our world today. All of these principles naturally ought to be manifested in the relationship that we wish to hold with China. As you know, we share uh, the, with the United States a convergent analysis of this country, which is, in our eyes, all at once a partner, a strategic competitor, or even an economic competitor, and a systemic rival. Each of those three words is important, and we must not forget any of them. And I have observed in my discussions with my American contacts at the new administration that ultimately we are using the same, that same triptych of words, it's sometimes even the, literally the same words. And now it is up to us to find a, a balance between these different approaches, which are interrelated. We must find a balance between those different approaches. And we do know that we will not always use them at the same time or in the same way in every area. And that is what we are discussing now. In practical terms, we must take initiatives that are coordinated as much as possible concerning each of the three pillars of the triptych that I just presented. And first, we must undertake cooperation initiatives. And let's be clear, without a commitment from China, we will not be able to respond to today's major challenges. There is the challenge of climate change, which China, as the leading emitter, emitter of CO2 on the planet, must uh, take on its share of the responsibility and to do this, we've been supporting China for 15 years via our development agency to fund its energy transition, which is essential. But it is necessary, including as Glasgow comes up, to speak with China about these stakes. There is also the challenge of the erosion of biodiversity. We've been working, all working on this with China with an eye to the COP15. 
There is also the challenge of worldwide inequalities, which have been exacerbated by the economic consequences of the pandemic. And that is why we are working with China in the framework of the G20 uh, in, in order to cancel debt in Africa. And finally, how could we not mention the reform of healthcare architecture, uh, an area in which Europe has committed heavily? We must make sure that we more effectively apply international health regulation, or perhaps we could create a One Health panel, which would create an alert and information mechanism that would inform us in, time, in real time about the risk of pandemics. On all of these topics, of course, we must bring China in, and we must, co we must convince China to cooperate. Just as we are doing now in terms of the essential investigations into the origins of the virus. Concerning all of these issues, which are absolutely will absolutely determine our future, we must sh make the, shift the boundaries. And it is even more important that these topics, climate, biodiversity, health, if we do not handle them seriously, and if we do not have the political commitment that is necessary, these issues may contribute to disorder and insecurity in the world. We also need to take initiatives uh, on the second part of the triptych to regulate international competition in terms of trade, technology, security. This competition, we can see that it takes various forms. And in particular, it comes into the multilateral domain. And it is all about the multilateral institution's ability to produce norms, norms that will apply to everybody, and that hopefully will influence and anticipate and promote the standards of tomorrow. It is significant in this respect that the election of general directors of international organizations, in particular the the directors who have true prescriptive power in the international scene, for example, the FAO or the ICAO, that these, that this is becoming a major political issue for the great powers. This is also the case for the World Trade Organization, which we must modernize and reform in order to achieve international trade rules that are more transparent and that ensure more fair competition. Because of its normative power and its skills and its determination to take on the balance of power whenever is necessary, which is now the balance of power is new, we must say that, I believe that the European Union must, in this effort, be a key partner of the United States. As I said just now, the European Union strategy for the Indo-Pacific will, will be finalized at the latest in the first half of 2022. This will be an important political milestone to guide our dialogue with the United States. And finally, we must take initiatives to promote our model and the universal value, values we hold. Because when China, China behaves as a systemic rival, the stakes are the conception of human beings, their dignity, their rights, and their liberties. What is at stake is the heart of our shared combat, our shared fight since 1945. And there, once again, Europe has valuable levers that it can pull to practically defend this vision. It has the strength of its internal market, which allows us to act uh, on contingents, which allows us to work in a reciprocal way. There is also the fact that the European Union and its member states are the world's leading donor for development and the leading donor in the humanitarian space. We also have our networks of influence on every continent. There is also the space that we occupy in multilateral institutions and the new frameworks of collective action that we have launched, like the Alliance for Multilateralism that I created with my German counterpart in 2019, and which has helped to hold up the walls of multilateralism, which has been under constant attack, attack for four years. However, we still have work to do to take full stock of certain issues where, indeed, the stakes are actually the future of our model and our values. For example, I'm thinking of the cyberspace, where we have to set up new norms to escape the twofold pitfall of digital authoritarianism and the jungle 2.0, where everything goes and therefore where anything is allowed. I'm thinking about the matter of the Uyghurs.
And this issue has already driven the European Union to impose sanctions based with the seriousness of the situation. And these are the first sanctions since the Tiananmen massacre in June 1989. These are the first EU sanctions since then. And I'm also thinking of the essential institution that is the UN Council of Human Rights, where we must show great determination. And of course, I must say, it, there may be points of disagreement within the transatlantic relationship. We are very close and we share the fundamentals, but we are not exactly the same. Because our collective preferences, though they do converge, are not always identical, are not always at the same time. And in a way, that's all for the best because this diversity enriches us. But I do not doubt that the new American administration understands that what founds our ambition to reinforce, to understand what founds our ambition to reinforce European sovereignty, it is not an agenda of protectionism nor an agenda to close in on ourselves. It is, it is an ambition that aims to maintain our capacity to make our own choices, to continue in Europe to be the only authors of our own history, and to refuse to become the simple subjects of others' histories. In short, to remain free. And to do this, we need to give ourselves the tools, and that is what we are currently doing in Europe in terms of the economy, trade, but also the military. And that is why I believe that the United States will see in this plan a, the guarantee of having stronger partners and more agile partners, because we cannot act alone in the brutal world in which we live, even though we're world powers, the United States, and ultimately the European Union. Our rebalanced transatlantic partnership, which will therefore, therefore be more sustainable in, with the, the Indo-Pacific pivot, will become a decisive asset in the context of a new international playing field. Thank you for your attention. so much, uh, Mr. Minister. I'm sure that everyone is delighted, as George said, to be uh, here in person to hear a speech, which might be a first uh, for many of us. And uh, especially that you have chosen the occasion of uh, July 14th and Bastille Day to be here, not only in Washington, but to address, I think, a topic that perhaps more than any other is at the top of the agenda in Washington uh, today with not only uh, this administration, but arguably the previous one as well. Uh, the foreign policy discussion is very much around the subjects in your address this morning, which is to say, what is the future of uh, transatlantic policy towards uh, China and the Indo-Pacific? And I, I think that's where I'd love to start our conversation today, uh, is to, to probe a little bit more, first of all, uh, there has been a recognition really since the Obama administration that we're perpetually pivoting at this point uh, to Asia. It's, I'm sure many will welcome uh, you saying that uh, Europe and France is also pivoting uh, towards Asia. Uh, of course, there's a big question about what does that exactly mean? And so I would love to ask you, uh, based on President Biden's first visit to Europe, his first international trip, he said that the primary goal of that trip was to rally the U.S. allies around a shared vision of what it means uh, to uh, engage and to confront China at this moment in time. However, President Macron, I think, was, was perhaps more skeptical than others when it came particular to reorienting NATO, even the very carefully worded language uh, in the NATO communique around uh, China was something that was a cause of concern. So perhaps you can elaborate uh, on the point in your speech to help us understand, is it a difference in emphasis at this moment in time? What is the objection uh, as you see it that President Macron and France has to the, the way in which the United States would like to take NATO towards China? Perhaps uh, the view is simply that, that NATO is a transatlantic and a European fundamentally alliance. Help us to understand that. Thank you.
Vous, vous faites peut-être... Euh, on m'entend bien là. You might be referring to two two rather strong expressions um, used by President Macron on the topic you just mentioned. And President Macron is used to um, using uh, strong language in order to to be understood properly. And um, at the time in um, an Anglo-Saxon magazine, he said that NATO, uh, what was it, uh, NATO was brain dead? Yes. So, first of all, he said so, and, and then, given that you're asking me about it, on the occasion of um, the G7 uh, meeting in Cornwall, he said, that the G7 is not an anti-Tinal club. So, all your comments have um, actually referred to, to these two uh, strong statements. So, first of all, about NATO, and then about the relationship with China and the Indo-Pacific. Over the past four years, there is some sort of a doubt, sheer doubt, as to the strength that the alliance can represent as to the solidity of the bonds, as to the firmness of the commitments. Some sort of a doubt. And when there is an element of doubt, it is becoming dangerous. An element of doubt as well, due to some internal level raise conflicts between uh, some members of the alliance, and I have in mind in particular um, the um, Turkish trend some doubts regarding the values. And over these four years, both due to this doubt and as well due to the fact that the world was becoming ever more brutal um, and given also um, that Europe was uh, gaining awareness as to its power. Well, for all of these reasons, Europe has adopted some uh, stronger um, tools for its security. First of all, Europe increased its defense spending, and as a matter of fact, this was a request, a long standing request by the United States, including by President Trump, but also because a number of European countries in their defense um, schemes um, included some more interoperability, and that was something new. And this comes to my mind just to describe how much has been achieved because back in 2015 or 2016, together with uh, the Germans, we suggested uh, um, that at the European level, we put together a permanent uh, structured cooperation, that is, a few countries saying that we will uh, get together on a number of matters. It was not very ambitious. It was about offering a better cooperation and interoperability of our actions on defense matters. And when at the time, together with my Mrs. van der Leyen, who is the Defense Minister of Germany, when we put forward that proposal, the 26 other members of the European Union, at the time we still had the United Kingdom, they, they, well, they had some sort of a polite reaction, but very, um, very aggressive outside the meeting room then. But now, we are all there. And, and those who came last, very much, uh, uh, we're wanting so so much wanting to join. So Europe, I believe, um, is more aware of its strength 
and uh, aware as well that if we want to control, control keep control of our destiny, uh, we, we, we shall um, um, deal with all of that. So it's not just about uh, a reaction to what President Trump was uh, doing or saying, but it is due to some uh, new developments around the world and due to this element of doubt that I was describing um, about NATO. And also due to the fact that there were some major threats, in particular that of terrorism um, and the impact on um, and, and some more conflicts in regions close to Europe. Something new as well is that President Biden put some, shed some new light on the United States commitment, and that took place in Brussels a few days ago on the occasion of the EU-US summit. And something new as well, something is that the members of the alliance began thinking or considering uh, what its future should be. So all of that came together. And as a result, uh, the summit in Brussels was a success, and we can consider it as a, um, a revival of the Transatlantic Alliance. First of all, because there was a strong moment when President Biden, and um, in a very solemn manner, which is important, it matters when you have all the heads of state and government to gathering. President Biden expressed the attachment and um, as far as I remember, the sacred element in Article 5. And the fact as well, and that um, the work of the experts group that was put together before was taken board and the need to reaffirm um, our values and that they were applicable to all of the members of the alliance. And as a matter of fact, Turkey is part of it. And also there is an acknowledgement of uh, Europe's role and its contribution to the transatlantic security. So it is an important step and I believe we're now uh, preparing um, in a positive spirit the summit that will take place in Madrid. On that occasion, we will uh, express and affirm uh, the new strategic concept of the alliance. Uh, this is a work in progress, and I believe it will lead to some sort of a reconstruction, uh, reviving of the alliance. And this work will take place in parallel with uh, the work undertaken by the European Union for itself. This is what we call uh, the strategic compass. And France itself will have to, 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 to deal with it until its conclusion because uh, this work will uh, be concluded uh, during the first semester of 2022 when France uh, presides over the European Union. And of course, we very much want um, uh, a coherence between uh, the strategic concept of uh, NATO and the strategic compass of the European Union. So all this is very positive. And this is um, happening for um, historical reasons and also because the, the world is becoming more brutal and there are more conflicts. Like I said earlier, the uh, transatlantic pivot towards the Indo-Pacific is a pivot of the relationship that we enjoy between uh, Europe, the United States and Canada towards that major stake, which is the Indo-Pacific. But as far as I'm concerned, this does not require changing the concept of the alliance. The alliance is a military um, alliance, defensive security alliance uh, that deals with the Atlantic. And as far as I know, um, the Indo-Pacific and China um, have no border with the Atlantic Ocean. Nonetheless, beyond NATO, beyond this um, uh, collective security tool we're putting in place for our own security, well, it has to pivot towards the Indo-Pacific. And when I talk about the Indo-Pacific, in my mind, 
in my mind, well, China is a power in itself. And the Indo-Pacific is a zone where, first of all, we shall guarantee um, freedom and security, no matter where we stand. It is a shared zone. But for us, it is also an opportunity. An opportunity to develop a model that we share with um, the countries um, of these oceans. It has to be an alternative to this model. And I believe we shall consider we're not, first of all, going against China but we are rather first and foremost going or moving with the Indo-Pacific countries in order uh, to develop uh, a new model. I'm sorry for taking the floor so long, but I wanted to explain this in more detail. Thank you, Mr. Minister. And let me just ask a quick question on NATO and the alliance before we move to the more broad question of, of Europe and the Indo-Pacific. It seems appropriate we're having this conversation about the future of NATO and security policy uh, on at, at the exact time when NATO's last great mission uh, is ending in Afghanistan, which also does not share a border with Europe, I might note. Um, President Biden said that the big difference in his foreign policy is that he's going to consult more with allies and work more closely in a more multilateral way than President Trump. Uh, what do you make in that sense of the, the US withdrawal this summer from Afghanistan? Uh, is that something that you feel everyone uh, is in agreement about? And, and how do you feel at the end of uh, 20 years, which is an enormous time for France and for NATO to have been uh, involved in Afghanistan and yet to be leaving with its future so uncertain? First of all, it is a reminder. The first time the Alliance used Article 5 was after uh, the attack against the, the Twin Towers uh, and in the context of the Afghan operation. I'm not sure everyone remembers. In particular, um, um, when we had all of this debate about Article 5 and uh, over the past few years and the doubt I was referring to earlier. But yet, the only occasion on which Article 5 was used by the Alliance was to defend the United States. No one is regretting it, but I think it is something uh, to very much put forward. My second comment regarding Afghanistan is a very personal one. When I took office as Defense Minister, France at the time uh, was involved, and as far as I believe, uh, remember we had some uh, 4,000 um, staff in Afghanistan, military staff. And um, a very few days after I took office, we lost four troops in the mountains behind Kabul. And that was um, the first time I was challenged this way, uh, given that I went and I uh, came back to France with uh, uh, the bodies of the soldiers. And it is something I strongly remember, of course. And then to express my support, my solidarity with uh, the French troops in Afghanistan and um, my solidarity with um, the comrades of uh, those fallen, I went and spent uh, a night in uh, Mishrab in the mountains, mm -hmm. close to where the soldiers had fallen. So I have some very strong memories of that. And uh, I would like also to, to remind everyone that um, um, not so long ago, um, our embassy was targeted um, in Kabul and at the time I was also defense minister and I went to see by myself. So we needed that commitment. It was about our collective security. And the attack, the terror attack against the Twin Towers uh, called for solidarity and a response to prevent any further aggressions of that type. 
and the decision of taken by the United States to withdraw and um, and the NATO's decision to withdraw from this fight. All of that is due, first of all, to um, um, the duration of the invention uh, of the presence and also political will. Somehow it is a bet. Uh, it is betting on a political uh, solution that could only uh, uh, happen uh, if there are no longer any uh, foreign troops in Afghanistan on the soil. It is a, a rather audacious bet, but there's probably no other solution. Uh, but to, uh, but it means that we shall uh, provide necessary support for this political solution to happen. Of course, there are many doubts and some question marks, but we need to make sure that there are indeed uh, some uh, uh, proper discussions with the Taliban and, and the um, Afghan authorities so that a political uh, solution be found for, these, for the Afghan people who suffered so much, so many tragedies. And it is a compromise that is required, such as the point of view of the United States uh, authorities, and such is ours. In your speech, you talked about the need to be really stripped of all naivete uh, in looking very clearly at the developments in China in recent years and in the region and how they might affect Europe and elsewhere. Uh, you also mentioned the sanctions that Europe imposed uh, on China because of uh, its uh, camps and repression in Xinjiang. Uh, do you believe that Europe and the United States have been slow to recognize uh, the, the new nature of the Chinese regime in Xinjiang and elsewhere? Uh, how much uh, do human rights need to be at the centerpiece of this uh, new strategy that you're working on formulating for Europe? Well, China itself has changed. When uh, one looks at uh, the speech delivered by President Xi, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, not only the content, um, which is aggressive, but also um, the um, the show, the presentation. It is not Deng Xiaoping. It is a new story. Which is making sure that the Chinese Communist Party will be strengthened as uh, the central element of China's policy with a purpose of domination, either directly or indirectly, um, with uh, this uh, 2049 horizon. And maybe we took too much time to realize this dimension over the past few years. Uh, it was not so obvious uh, during the first uh, years um, of President Xi's term of office, whereas now it is um, being affirmed in a rather violent way. So against that, we need to apply the three principles I was referring to earlier. A necessary partnership. Um, we need to be demanding, but nonetheless, it is a necessary partnership if we want to address the main um, uh, global challenges I was mentioning. Competition. We need to demand transparency. Reciprocity. And as well, uh, conditionality. Conditionality when it comes to um, respecting um, the rights, but also the standards. And it also means that we need to stand firm on the main stakes where we are rivals when it comes to our models, our systems. But at the same time, we need to play the card of the Indo-Pacific, which means to 
offer in a very advanced area an alternative solution, a solution based on um, compliance with the rules and respect for the identities and development. It means that we need to connect all of our efforts and actions and to bring about this uh, alternative um, um, in proximity, even though, once again, it is a broad area. So, of course, uh, the elements of the triptych sometimes, um, they are being combined and we should accept it. If I take an example, when China and the European Union agree on an investment deal, and we, we see there is some progress regarding uh, public procurement, access to the markets, and identification of uh, public aid. This is um, very good. And as a result, the European Commission says, uh, well, it is now time to, to sign the deal because there is some progress. It is good. Um, it is in everybody's interest, and economically in particular, um, for Europe and um, Indirectly, it can be as well for the Europe, for the United States, but of course we we demanded a, a minimum of respect for the rights of the Uyghurs, and the European Union adopted a number of sanctions given the way um, the Uyghurs are being treated, and the response from China was um, to adopt sanctions in return against um, members of the European Parliament. And they always say no. So fair competition, reciprocity, compliance with uh, the standards. And then you have the systemic rivalry. So this is where we stand at the moment. And I believe we should uh, stick to that, uh, to this guideline. And let me say something else to make sure there is no ambiguity. NATO can be the proper forum for the Allies to talk about the consequences of um, China's military surge and the impact of on, on our own security. The alliance is not a global alliance. It is not an alliance against China, first of all, because it is a transatlantic alliance. It is not a global one and it is a, um, an alliance for security and defense, but when our own European interests and all transatlantic interests are being threatened by military actions by China, indirectly threatened, we need to talk about it somewhere, um, including to talk about the cyber attacks, and the alliance might be the right place to do so, but uh, the purpose of the alliance is not economic, uh, technological, it is not to deal with um, the major climate challenges, and the European Union itself has a number of tools and can play uh, its own um, um, part uh, with everything that connects it to the United States. And indeed, uh, the president, uh, President Trump at the time, also met the European Union in itself, and this is a format that can be most useful as well. You mentioned the investment deal with China that was negotiated. Do you believe uh, that as a result of the back and forth over sanctions, is that deal dead uh, and should it be? It is for China to decide. One can wonder and tactically about the way the Chinese authorities dealt with the sanctions adopted by uh, the European Union. Um, when we um, acknowledge uh, what was happening in Xinjiang, including forced labor, the Chinese authorities decided to sanction, I believe, one or two members of the European Parliament per group. Mm -hmm. 
as well as um, a number of institutions of the European Union. So, uh, what else could they do if they didn't want to uh, implement uh, the, the, the treaty? They're targeting precisely those who are meant to approve the text agree between the Europeans and China. And it's not um, by lack of um, attention, uh, my finger, the Chinese institutions work well enough so that it cannot be an oversight. So it is all in the hands of uh, the Chinese. So one thing we haven't mentioned at all today, uh, although we've talked about security and NATO, is Russia. And I'm curious how you view uh, the relations between Russia and China, whether uh, you see the prospect of them uh, as President Biden has suggested that we're moving into an age of confrontation between democracies and autocracies. So I would, I think everyone here would value your assessment of the dealings between Russia and China today and whether you agree with President Biden that this is now uh, essentially a confrontation between systems of government and ways of viewing the world. Well, when President Biden came to Europe, I know that he also met with President Putin. And I remember how much criticism there was when, uh, in the summer of 2019, President Macron took the initiative of meeting President Putin. Um, uh, his line was, uh, Russia is our neighbor. And uh, when uh, one has a neighbor, even, the, even in particular, um, a difficult neighbor, better talk to him because the neighbor won't go away. And um, like I said before, Russia has no intent of uh, moving anywhere else. It is our neighbor. They're unbearable. Um, you know, um, um, the, Russia is very tempered, but there it is. So we need to talk to one another. And President Macron expressed it differently, but when he said uh, there was a, a, a need to talk to Russia, there was a lot of criticism. Nonetheless, he was right, and just like... Uh, President Biden is right to talk to the Russians. And I'm uh, saying it uh, here again because at the time that um, led to a lot of um, criticism in France. So we need to talk to the Russians, um, but the logic should be um, for us, the Europeans, to acknowledge that Russia is in Europe. And if we were to uh, uh, refuse to talk to Russia, uh, it would be an invitation for uh, Russia to turn to the east, to leave Europe. At the moment, Russia does not perceive itself as being European, but we should perceive it as being part of Europe. And an agreement was found to work on the stability of our relationship and on uh, the predictability of um, armaments and to revive a, politic, a positive momentum on arms control. It is something positive. It is a step forward. And like you were saying, the President of the United States uh, wishes the Europeans to contribute to that. And this has been confirmed to me on the occasion of the meetings I had in Washington, so that it's not happening above our heads. So it is something positive. Does it mean that there will be a new relationship um, that will enable Russia uh, to, to, to walk away from some common interests with China? I do not know, but it is something necessary. And just like yourself, I note that over the past few months, there has been a military rapprochement between the uh, Russia and China. This is one more reason for us to work on um, um, with Russia in order to control our own security. Bearing in mind that in Russia as well, there is some sort of a, an authoritarian trend domestically. Um, and um, 
internationally as well with the cyber attacks in relation to which we shall be extremely strict at the same time we need to work with uh, russia um, this one in particular uh, china because we, we have uh, some shared interests so let's do it so we're we kind of running out of time one more question maybe one more question then sir thank you so much i think you've given us a real insight into this what is the one thing that you are hoping to take away from your visit to Washington. Uh, the resumption of in-person meetings means uh, you can be even more persuasive, perhaps, uh, in person. But, you know, if there was one thing that you could get the Biden administration to agree upon uh, with France right now, what would it be? I see the ambassador wants uh, to answer this one too, perhaps. <laughs> Can I do it with my answer with um, a lot of emotions? Is it possible? An emotional answer and a topical answer as well. I have a very strong concern, very emotional, as to the situation in Lebanon. It and I was very pleased to note that uh, during the discussions I had with Secretary Blinken in Paris a few days ago, um, to note that he too was very attached to the Lebanese people. Beyond uh, the strategic and geopolitical stakes that uh, uh, the solidity of Lebanon represents for all of us, the integrity of Lebanon, uh, the um, necessi necessity to isolate uh, Lebanon from uh, the conflicts in the region. There is something that we share and uh, very much would like us to, to move uh, forward uh, together in order to thrive and save Lebanon from itself, save Lebanon from its own issues. We need to talk to the Lebanese people itself, and I have the feeling that we will be doing it. And it is, if it is something I take uh, back home from this visit, it will be excellent news. Thank the Minister, uh, and thank all of you for uh, being here to resume our uh, in-person life of fascinating conversations and especially on such a topical subject. Thank you, sir, for sharing uh, your national holiday with us as well. Uh, and thank you to all of you.